The Wycliffeite doctrine comes into Bohemia and we know that here it meets a faithful man called John Huss. And uh, of the three men that we will discuss, one we've discussed, John Wycliffe, and the next we'll discuss Martin Luther. This man, it seemed to me, uh, suffered probably the most, I think, to the extent that he paid the ultimate price. He paid for his belief with his own life. Jan Hus, or John Hals, as we would call him in English. It seems to me that God calls us differently. It seems to me that some have been given a heavier burden than others. And, and, and sometimes I think it's just different burdens then. Wycliffe for all his struggles and the persecution that came on him, he had a protector in a man called John of Gaunt. Pretty much, even when the Roman Catholic Church was persecuting him, yet we know that he continued to work. And he died of what we would call natural causes. A disease struck him, he was fairly old, and then he died. You would say that what happened to him later, I think that was in 1414, around 1417, when after the Council of Constance, that's what they called it, they exhumed his bones and burnt them. But he was already dead. Long time, actually. Uh, close to 40 years. 30 something years in the ground. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. As we would see, Martin Luther would have his struggles with the Roman Catholic Church. He would have a protector in a man called Frederick the Wise. He's a very wise man, actually. He was an elector in a place called Saxony, a very powerful man. And that was Luther's protector. And Luther, it seems, for all his struggles and persecution, he also died of natural causes. In fact, he died at home, on his bed, among his friends and his peoples. That doesn't mean he didn't suffer. He suffered a lot. But this bohemian reformer, John Hulls, this one died badly. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, because I... I can't think of it. I can't think of it. I'm trying to wrap my head around the concept because uh, from this coming Sunday, I'm sort of going into the sixth message in our series on the doctrine of death, hell, and the lack of fire. And I want to try and describe hell in its four descriptive phrases in the Bible. But still, my head can't be wrapped around the idea of being burnt slowly. I struggle with that thought in my head. I hear somebody was trapped in a burning house and they were burnt alive, like in the post-election violence, if you remember. In, in 2007, in Kiamba, these people that were in a church and the church was locked and fire lit inside and you can only imagine the screams and the pain, the children, the mothers, uh, the fathers, and they look at each other and they, they're burning. It's not instant death. It's not like being shot, you see. Your head refuses to think that way. Your mind recoils from it. And to imagine then that a council sits in judgment and pronounces a decision that in fact you're going to be killed and the mode of killing is not beheading where your head is going to be cut off by one swift blow and it's almost a few seconds and you'll be gone. 
but that in fact you will be hoisted up on a tree, stakes they called it, and then at the foot of that wooden tree they will gather firewood so that you will be standing on the firewood and then they will light fire on the firewood and the flames will begin to burn your feet coming upwards. How long would it take? What pain would you feel? And so sometimes we, we say the Christian faith is one that we take casually now. To be a Christian is a very casual thing. Yet for some people, it wasn't a casual affair. We receive the truth of God today and we glory in God's truth and we love the truth of Scripture. But how are they preserved for us? How are they passed on to us from the generations of our forbearers? It is a faith that was purchased by the blood of its Redeemer and has been sustained by the blood of the saints all through. How dare we treat it lightly? How dare we be casual with it? So John House is born in 1370, not, not, not very far from the times of John Wycliffe. Um, he's born in the year 1370. In 1394, which will be 24 years later, the man earns a Bachelor of Arts degree. At the year 24, he has a bachelor's degree. Two years later, when he's 26, he gets a master's degree. Now again, stop and observe the lesson which you have observed in the lives of the men that we studied so far, including John Wycliffe, that these men gave themselves to study. They were not ignorances, fools, who just gave themselves to a cause blindly. They were men who knew what they were doing. They were enlightened individuals, but the truth of God had captured them so strongly that they were able to give up everything else. We know that by the year 1401, the teachings of Wycliffe had been widespread in Bohemia. By the year 1401, those teachings had been widespread in Bohemia. We think that this man, John Hulse, may have been converted through the ministry of the Lollards. These are the men that had the message of John Wycliffe and preached it. So when he understood then the Wycliffe doctrine, the man became decidedly a Wycliffe. In fact, he believed so much in Wycliffe that later on John Hulse would translate the works of Wycliffe written in English into Czech language. Again, observe that any true minister is usually occupied with his people. He is concerned with his people. Wycliffe with the Englishmen, John House with the Bohemians. Sadly, we are concerned with Europeans. Isn't it the dream of every preacher to go to Europe? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For what? Why? What's your problem? Have you gone to cyber cafes and seen them? Oh boy, they're there. But I come soon. People want to zoom. But the primary concern of those men was their own people. And they said, we want our people to hear God's word. That is the biblical way. Jesus, when he started his ministry, said, I have not been sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. A Canaanite woman comes to him and says to him, Lord, 
my child is suffering of a disease and Jesus turns and says look woman I cannot take the bread of children and give it to the dogs in other words I am called first to the Jews and so Paul reflecting on this matter says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 he says I'm not ashamed of the gospel for this is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe it is all who believe but first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 it says, And you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and then you shall be my witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem, in Jerusalem home, in Judea, the larger place from home, in Samaria, further north, but within Palestine, and then to the ends of the earth. And as we look at the Acts of the Apostles, that's exactly how the gospel traveled. There's something local about the gospel. There's something local about the minister. You cannot be thinking international. You know, everybody, Christian church international. Everybody wants to put international in front of their church name. Please, it's okay. But listen to Paul in Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Paul says, this is my heart. Desire, Romans 10 verse 1, that my people should be saved, for I bear witness of them that they have zeal for God, but this is not zeal according to knowledge. And it is only when they rejected it that he said, I now turn to the Gentiles. You know, there is a saying within political world that all politics is local. All politics is local. They are accusing, accusing the Jubilee, Kikuis, and the ODM Luos of being tribal, isn't it? And they are tribal, let's call it what it is. They are tribal. And the Kalenjin with their Ruto, tribal as well. Everybody is tribal. Now, how do the politicians explain this when they're on TV? They say, look, we are national leaders, mm -hmm. but all politics <laughs> is local. Because the people who vote for me yeah, are the local people. Yeah. And there's a sense in which that is true. Mm -hmm. For the preacher, all ministry is local. I think it was three years ago, maybe four, when I began to struggle with the idea of my own ministry. Because I began to feel that I was beginning to have more influence and greater influence outside of this locality than within this locality. To some extent it is still true, even now. How many people in our church have read my books? Well, it's good international people are reading it. How many people have read it? So, I struggled with that. Because all ministry, at the end of the day, must be local. And so Ian Hus, John House, translates the weekly fight uh, material into Czech language so that his people can as well uh, get uh, this knowledge of truth. Now, again, there wasn't much difference with what Wycliffe did. That's why he was called a weekly fight himself. He attacked the same things that Wycliffe attacked. So a lecture in the life of John Wycliffe is as good as a lecture in the life of John Howes. He attacked papal authority. And we've discussed what that means. The authority of the church vis-a-vis -vis the authority of scripture. Things that Wycliffe dealt with. House dealt with. Corruption in the church by the clergy, worldliness, hedonism, simony, those things that Wycliffe attacked, John House as well attacked. Wycliffe is the one who said that salvation is in Christ alone 
by his righteousness alone are we justified. Hals took up the same father, the same truck, and he ran with it. Something funny about John Hals was he was particular. He was particular. He was careful that the preaching in the church be done in local language. Bohemian, Czech. You know, I wouldn't mind myself if some of us would dedicate themselves to preaching in Luya, pure. Understand the doctrines of grace. Process them in your head. Make sure you have the correct doctrine, correct translation. Bring this in the language of your people. So that the lady who comes from the farm, who has never gone to a classroom, can in fact hear the word of God come in her own language. I despise the preachers who preach in the local village and they mix English in their preaching. I despise a preacher like that. Hallelujah. Huh? Mommy saw me where? Do you know what Jesus has done for you? Hallelujah. The lady doesn't understand what you say. <laughs> she doesn't. Well, she thinks you're smart. My preacher knows English. <laughs> He's gone to school. No. But are you helping? No, you're not. And sometimes be careful. Because what we end up doing is we end up showing how intelligent we are, yet never communicate to people. Now, I could very well preach in English here and have somebody else translate. I don't do that. I lecture you in English in our own church pulpit, always. I speak in Swahili. And if I say an English expression, there'll always be a Swahili coming behind it. It's just how it is. So he insists then that there has to be that. And, and we have to convince ourselves that the reform agenda, the message of grace, the truths of the gospel will not go until you internalize the message, process it, synthesize it, bring it in the local languages of the people, and then let the people glory in the truth of God being spoken in their mother tongues. And so whether we meet them in Nairobi or in Amsterdam, they may not know how to speak English, but we will fellowship because they know the truth of God in their own language. It's a beautiful thing. So John House insists that this has to happen. Of course, because of these things and standing against the Church of Rome, the Church of Rome accused him of heresy. Teaching heresy. So this man is a heretic. Now the charge of heresy was a terrible charge then. It was a charge that said you are teaching wrong doctrine. And the penalty was what? Yes. Death. Now let's agree. Let us agree here. Alright? Let us agree. That heresy is a terrible thing. Let's agree. Even the Church of Rome could see that whoever teaches heresy is only worthy of what? Yeah. Death. The truth is, that wasn't heresy. It is they who had heresy. But at least this one concept they understood that heresy is such a heinous crime that the only penalty for it would be death. Now, our Lord Christ said of this thing, and I'm, I'm bringing a lesson here. Our Lord Christ said, whoever, whoever will cause these little ones to stumble, it were better for him if a millstone would be tied around their necks and they be cast into the sea. That is, they drown and their body must never surface to be seen. That's what Jesus is saying. 
destroying the little ones is such a heinous crime, isn't it? This is what Paul says in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 16, I believe. Chapter 16. Chapter 6, sorry. Was it Romans? Maybe it's Romans. I just need to confirm that so I'm not misleading you. In fact, it is Romans. Chapter 16, verse 17, I think. That's correct. Romans 16, verse 17. It says, If any man teaches any other doctrine apart from the doctrine of Christ, you are to do what that man? You are to mark that man and do what? Avoid him. That's what it says. Mark him. Don't say, oh, you know, I'm not going to say it over to you. <laughs> no, we are Christians. We must, we have love. Let's not throw stones at one another. No, no, no. Paul says, mark them. Put a mark on such people. And then do what? Avoid. Avoid. In chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 5, Paul says they will have what? A form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such do what? Turn away, he says. What I'm trying to tell you is that even the church of Rome, in its own twisted way, in its own depraved way, understood that heresy was a terrible crime. Now, the only reason I'm bringing that argument and trying to examine that is how we hold lightly wrong doctrine. We don't seem to be concerned with it. Somebody comes to preach in your church, it's a wrong doctrine. You don't seem to have a problem with it. In the Old Testament, if a false prophet was found to be false prophet. He says something wasn't true. What would be happened to him? What would be done? Killed. Killed by how? Stoned to death. So even the Church of Rome understood that no, 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 no. Heresy is not a small thing at all. This is big. And so we must be concerned with doctrine. We must be concerned with practices. Now, this is what my brother Barnabas gave us an example some time back. And I've always enjoyed that example. This is, pretend that's a straight line, okay? From point A to point B. It's a straight line. Am I still within the line? Yes. Have I missed the line? Yes. But if I miss it by a big thing, no, it's, it's a very small thing. So this is where we say, ah, come on, it's a small thing, let's go. This is not a big thing, leave it, please. Let's not fight over these small issues, they say. Let's not divide the church over small things. I'm going to show you. So we didn't fight here, did we? Because it was a small? But you see, I've already left the way. Am I getting closer to point B or am I going far away from it? So the more I go with that thing that looked very small, the bigger it gets. And by the time we realize we need to fight it, it is now a tree that is already grown and it has borne fruit. And then we say, you know, we never, we, we never, we never knew this breath is like this. Look at what has happened to him. No, 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 no. You ignore the signal. Mark them and avoid them, he says. So even the way the Roman Catholic Church treated John Wycliffe and treated John Hulse will tell you even they understood that the scripture holds a very high regard of truth. 
So our problem is, what is the truth? What is the truth? Anyway, so it was in, on July the 6th, 1415, that a church council, that's the Council of Constance, okay, found John Hulls guilty of heresy and sentenced him to death. Now there were two accusations there. One is, of course, heresies, but one was very particular. He was accused of being a disciple of who? Why? Now I'm interested in that kind of thing because as you will come to hear Luther after disputation in Augsburg and another disputation in Heidelberg, is it? Or Eisleben, whatever. Luther would in one of those disputations be at pains to clarify that he is not a disciple of Hals. Because Hals had been condemned by a formal church council. Now, a formal church council which took bishops together and the Pope ratified, my friend, that was the voice of God, Vox Dei. So Luther found it hard to say he is a friend of someone who the voice of God through the council had condemned. And you see that was a, 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 an interesting discussion. And the cardinal, Catholic cardinal, who was arguing with Luther before that council had only one agenda. To push Luther to accept that he is a household. And so whatever Luther said, he said, what do you teach on scripture? This. What does Hans teach on scripture? This. How are you different? <laughs> and Luther would take a break. And when he came from that break, he had already studied Hans. He looked at Hans and he said, well, I'm denying this brother. But this is my brother. And the things he's teaching are the things I'm teaching. And he came and said, in fact, I agree with that man. And it comes, that, that, that's it. It was over now. Pick up. Now you're going to die because of that. Um, it's like in the courts when a precedence has been established. Uh, I did law for two years. So I understand the doctrine of precedence. They call it case law. Okay? Sometimes judges don't rely on the constitution. Uh, they go to what they call case law. There was a case like this 27 years ago. The facts were similar. What did the judges decide then? It's called the principle of ratio dissidenti. All right? The facts are similar. Therefore, the decision must be? Uh, especially when it's a court of equal standing or of higher standing that is sitting in judgment. And so, by case law or the doctrine of precedence, Luther was condemned by being proved to be a household. Because house was only condemned a heretic if you take the things of us, we don't need to hear evidence now. You're done. Anyway, that's Luther. But we have not come to him yet. So they condemn Hans for preaching the truth of God. And such a brilliant man. And he, like Wycliffe, had raised up men, and in this case, women, who believed this doctrine. And these people were called the Halsans. Again, let's observe that leadership is not determined really by how many church members are in church, but by how many leaders you've raised who can take up the mantle and push. Of course, I'm redacting this history in large extent because there is much there that was very political. In fact, the Pope even instituted a crusade against the Halsites. That is, they are to be killed. And they took up arms, all right? Weapons. And they defended themselves against the intruding Rome. Thank you, brother. Halsites. Okay? <laughs> so
So at this council then, when he was being condemned as heretic, they asked him to recant, to deny his teachings, to say they were wrong. He refused. And again I wonder, again I wonder, what does it feel like to be the presence of princes and kings and bishops? And you know clearly that what I'm facing now is death. And the only thing they're telling you is to speak with your mouth and say, I don't believe that anymore. Well, to be, to be, to be quite honest, they don't know what's in your heart, do they? And you could rationalize. You could actually explain it away and say, oh, it's only my mouth. But my heart, I still love Jesus. I still believe the truth. So let me tell them what they want to hear for the sake of my children at home. This is why we read in Romans chapter 10 that if you believe in your heart, you confess with you. He's not referring to the sinner's prayer. He's referring to standing up for Christ even in the most adverse circumstances. For the Son of God had declared that he or she would be ashamed of me before many witnesses, the same I would be ashamed of before my Father and before the angels in heaven. So there is a requirement in our life of faith, in our defense of the truth of God, that we not only believe it with our hearts, but that we confess it with our mouths. It had nothing to do with the sinner's prayer in Romans chapter 10. Nothing at all. It had everything to do with people who refused to denounce Jesus. And they say, Jesus is Lord, if you take off my head, it is Lord and Savior. You know, church history records the story of Polycarp, that old man, 84 year old, who was asked to recant and to deny Jesus. And the 84 year old man said, why should I do that? I'm now an old man. And since my youth, this man Jesus has been good to me. Why would I not? <laughs> it's a very simplistic way of thinking, isn't it? But it's truthful. It's, it's Christian. For out of the abundance of the heart, and so sometimes the calling for us, dear brothers and sisters, is that the faith we hold in our hearts, in private, in secret, are we ashamed? Is there something that prevents us from declaring it publicly? And sometimes it's because you don't want to lose friends. A very small price, but are we willing to pay that price? Sometimes it's just that they will expel you from church, for example. Small price, but are we willing to pay? So he refuses, this man. John House he refuses. He says, I will stick with Christ and the gospel. Now, you know, there's a, there's a text in Matthew chapter 10 and, and verse 28. It's, it's, it's an interesting, how be it, scary text. Um, it says, Do not fear he who can kill the boy, but has nothing to do with the soul. Fear him. Who after killing the body will also destroy the soul in eternal life. And, 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 and I think, here's the lesson. Here's the lesson, friends. And I'm hoping to bring this lesson in the kind of messages I'm preaching in church now. Starting from this and again. We, I'm hoping to scare the people. Like I've told them. When I was, no, I declared it, didn't I? At the very beginning, I said my intentions in this message are three. One of them is, those of you who don't know Christ, you need to be scared. I will scare you, and I'm aiming for it. 
But those of you who know Christ, I want you to be encouraged and to see where Christ has taken you from. And that your worship then will be broken. Anyway. The point then is here. <coughs> Those who don't know the terror of God. And the eternal punishment which is to come. Will back on. They will cave. They will give in. Because they will fear this temporary taunt. But anybody who has been given a glimpse of the future and to know that there is no equivalent, there is no comparison to the kind of suffering that awaits people endlessly in eternity, they will say, this will only happen maximum an hour. Maybe two hours, I'll be dead. I'll feel nothing. By the lake of fire, we are told, it is forever and forever and forever. So it's a choice, isn't it? And some of these people understood it's a choice. I'll tell you what, in, in, I think S.M. Hilton, in the book Sketches, it's, it's the book at the top, top, top right there. Um, S.M. Hilton does tell a story, I think it's him, or is it Fox's Book of Matters, or whichever, of these two saints who were being burnt at the stakes. Being burnt at the stakes. And as the fire was coming up on their feet, they were telling each other, take out, take out, take out. This is temporary. Tonight, we will open our eyes in glory. And we should eat supper with the Lord. Tonight. See, people who've seen the future can deal with the present. And that is why we've got to ask, when was the last time you had a message on hell in your church? Not just mentioned, hell explained. Hell propounded and expounded. When did you hear a message on heaven and the glories of heaven? When? Except seven keys, three principles to happy marriage. I don't know, the seminar is coming, couple seminar there, and the other one here, how to raise children, or uh, <coughs> mental health seminar. <laughs> <Boom>. <laughs> no, we're laughing, but are these things happening? Three days of empowerment summit. Summit, apostle, who, who is coming? And so we are building this, we are building this here, we are building this. Now this man had a clear view of eternity, they understood it. <laughs> By the way, I don't know I'm stuck on this idea here. But even people who changed world history, right? Leave, leave Christian history, all right? Leave that alone. World history. The people who change world history are those people who accepted that death and pain is part of the process of getting there. One man comes to mind immediately in this continent. Who is he? Nelson Mandela, Madiba. Oh, that famous statement on the last day of his trial with the apartheid court. And he said, there are some ideals for which I live. These are the ideals I live for. The liberation of the black man. It's so important to me. I live for this thing. And if need be said, Mandela, I'm prepared to die for this idea. Was that ring true throughout history? Those are the words that made Mandela great. And then, of course, they took him to Robben Island for 27 years. He never knew where he would come out. And they kept telling him, if you accept the apartheid regime, we release you. In fact, we'll give you a post in our government. He said, no. I'll die here. It's fine. 
He came out of prison an 84 year old man. His strength gone. His wife Winnie Mandela had been now embroiled in scandals, the sex scandals and all these other things. For a man in prison to endure those kind of things. An ideal for which I live and if need be, for which I'm prepared to die. Well, in India, there was a man called Mahatma Gandhi. The bloodless revolution, well, not bloodless. <laughs> they say nine violent. But it became bloody. The blood of Indians. Again, a man who gave his life to a cause. We read the ministry. Can I tell you, on a very local level, part of the appeal of this conman today called Raido Ding, I think he's a conman now. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. But I think some of you are not looking at me nicely. <laughs> well, I think he's a political conman. He's, he's gone into the system. He's no longer the same man we need. But I think part of the reason people still feel, you know, you take Raido anyway, even in Rift Valley where they hate him to the core, you take him there. I saw him go to uh, Central Kenya, where in fact he is the devil. Riley in Central Kenya is the devil in flesh. <laughs> right? But still the people want to come out to see him and to hear him. They hate him, but is he coming? We want to come and hear him, say his stories. I think part of that appeal is informed by the nine years he spent in detention, the longest serving political detainee mm. in the country. If you live for a cause, you must be prepared to suffer for that cause. I do think that Mwai Kibaki will never be remembered. But that's my view, really. Except from the jokes. He'll never be remembered. We remember Kenyatta because of some things. Kapinguria. This man went into prison, didn't he? So there's, there's a sense in which his, his life and his sacrifice makes us closer to him, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, Mikey Daniel Moy will be remembered for all the wrong things, of course. <laughs> <laughs> for the, for the errors. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, yeah, four yeah. years. And mm -hmm. When he was retiring, he said, I'm just getting enough experience now. Mm -hmm. Now I'm retiring. He said, what? What, what did you say? So as a preacher, as a Christian, man or woman, that which will cause you then to be fruitful, I think, partly, is to bear the marks of Christ. To bear the marks of Christ. These are, these are to the Christian and to the preacher, the medals of an army general. You know, you know the way they give medals to... Usually when they come from war or a peacekeeping mission in Namibia, then they are promoted and a medal is given. They are assuming you've seen some things there which other people haven't seen. You've suffered a bit, removed from your family, you know. And if you read Galatians chapter 6 and verse, I think, 17, uh, where Paul says, Now let nobody trouble me any longer. Why, Paul? Because in my body, says Paul, I bear out the marks. the marks of Christ. What we have today is a very shallow, pathetic brand of Christianity. Bread and blueprint. Let's come to church and enjoy ourselves. Let's have fun. You know, I actually heard somebody, I was watching an interview of an American pastor. Is it? Yes, an American pastor. When he was interviewed, he said, so what's, what's, what's the philosophy of your church? What draws, because thousands of people actually come to that church, what's, what's the thing that draws people to your church? And he said, you know, if I'm going to summarize the philosophy of our church and the appeal of our church to the American people, it's going to be this three-letter word. Fun. Fun. We make church fun. What? And they thought he had said a very nice thing. Mm. From the way we create our music, from the way we arrange the praise and worship and the uniforms they have, 
from the way you know the pastor greets the people. Turn to the person next to you, tell them you look better than yesterday. And tell them you're wonderful. <laughs> well, they're not wonderful, they're sinners. Give them a high five. <laughs> it's a lot of childish things you do in church, isn't it? Seriously. Turn to another one, high five. Come and find your five wood in charge. So we are not worthy to be numbered with the faithful of God's people. And I say this uh, to, to, to some degree to boil your blood, you know, to get you to be angry with what we have now. And hopefully to see something else. So they, they took him and they would, they would put, um, what do we call that? No. You know when they're taking you for death penalty, usually they have this hood over your head. But for us they took a cardboard cap and they put it on him and on it was written, the leader of the heretics. And they ushered him to the stakes whereupon they hoisted him. He lit a fire. And he died then praying for the people that God would forgive them. But that in fact, not only would God forgive them, but that God would have mercy on him, the young Even if I give my body to be burnt, says Paul in Romans chapter 3. 13, not Romans, 1 Corinthians 13. Yeah. Yet if I have not love, I'm nothing. So the man is being burnt, yet the love for the people. It's like William Tyndall. Later on, you'd meet William Tyndall, the man who he was called the servant of the Lord. Such a beautiful man. He had vowed and said, I will make every peasant know the Bible in England while I draw breath. And because of that, then they burnt him alive. And when he was being lit up in flames, his only prayer was this, God opened the eyes of the king of England. He didn't take long. His majesty, King James, authorized the publication of the 1611 King James Version of the Bible. But here's, 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 here's the lesson then that you pick up even from the martyrdom of John Harris that he didn't consider even at his death that his sacrifice for the truth and for God qualified him to go to heaven. He still pleaded for mercy. Jesus, the son of David, have mercy. Because if anybody would be in heaven, if anybody would be justified, if anybody would meet God, it's not because they were heroes. No, not because they were heroes. Not because they died. That's Muslim theology. If you die a shaheed, die al mujahideen, you know, um, a martyr, a shaheed, then you go to heaven without question and you will get what 10 virgins to enjoy your